Hello and welcome. I see Otter watching in Massachusetts, Chris in Columbia, Kess in Missouri. We have The Sims watching in California, Amber in West Virginia. I am so excited to have Dr. Prosanta Chakrabadi join us today. Everyone give some claps in the chat if you're watching live. Welcome. Thanks for having me. So you are an ichthyologist, and I anticipate that some people watching might not know what an ichthyologist is. Can you tell us what that is and sure. how you got to be one? Yeah, well, an ichthyologist is uh, someone who studies fishes. And yes, you say fishes when it's a uh, plural and you talk about multiple species of fish. Um, and uh, so there are people who study the evolution of fishes like I do, some people who study ecology or other things, but we're all like theologists studying fishes. And I became one uh, sort of as a natural history nerd growing up in New York City and um, finding uh, a mentor who happened to be an ichthyologist, Melanie Stiazny at the American Museum of Natural History. And she got me in with the cool crowd and I uh, did an undergrad project with her and then a, a, a PhD at the University of Michigan on fishes and uh, then a postdoc and got my job here in 2008 uh, as a fish curator. So that's my the short version of my path to becoming an ichthyologist. <laughs> a fish curator. So I have to ask, do you have a favorite fish? I, I I don't know. It depends day to day. I'll be talking about one of my favorite fishes. I have lots of favorite fishes, but I'll talk about Cryptotara uh, in some of my slides. That's a cave fish from Thailand that we collected and studied uh, a few years ago. That's pretty neat. And uh, I'll show you that uh, today. Excellent. So let's, are, are you ready to, to share some pictures? Sure, let's do it. Let me share some, right. some images here. We'll pull up some slides and learn more about the fascinating field of ichthyology. So let me know if you can you see it okay? Back yes. Here. Yep, it is there. So excellent. Well, thanks, Jenny, for um, having me um, speak about my profession, something I I really love and enjoy doing. And hopefully I'll inspire some of you to love and enjoy the study of natural history, if not fishes, in a moment. But I just wanted to start by telling you I'm speaking to you from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and um, I'm on the campus of LSU. And, and as soon as I step out of the museum doors here, I see these two uh, Native American mounds. So I want to just acknowledge them. This is the ancestral land of the Chittimacha and Choctaw. And I can't forget that when I look at these 5,000 year old mounds. So these mounds- 5,000 years old, wow. Uh, they're older than the Egyptian pyramids, and they were made when there were still woolly mammoth walking around in Siberia. So they're a testament to those who, who lived in this area before us. And they're part of our museum's uh, um, research. And so I'll talk to you about fishes, but I wanted to start with these Native American um, ancestral lands here. That is neat, thank you. No problem. And so this is me in my native habitat. So I'm a fish curator, as was mentioned, and I'm holding a jar here. And each jar, we have about 350,000 specimens of fishes. And each jar contains one or multiple specimens. And each one is a story. Uh, each one's also a data point. They tell us about um, where something was collected, how it was collected, who collected it and about the environment, what species is found where, and, and that's evidence by the, by the specimen. But it's a story too of, of the people who are in those areas and how they treat their land and, and how they uh, understand these species. And so what does a curator do? So as curator of fishes, I collect and study in the field. Um, I organize and catalog these new collections that we bring in. We store and maintain these collections so that we can do loans and do research on our own. So we don't just collect these organisms for ourselves, but to uh, share them with uh, people around the world uh, so they can do science and research on these um, specimens. And are the um, specimens in water or some other liquid? We have a couple questions in the sure, chat about no, that. Okay. They are first fixed in formalin, which uh, fixes the cells and then they're transferred to water, and then they're, they're stored in ethanol, 75% ethanol for 
uh, the majority of their time. So they can stay like that for hundreds of years. We have collections from hundreds of years ago and that historical collections help us compare with what we have today. Uh, so they're very important, but yeah, they're, they're just an alcohol. So they're, you can touch them and uh, you won't get burned or anything. Um, and we use these collections, not just for research, but for training and teaching others about um, the world's natural history. Um, so this was me last year um, collecting, or, or, you know, this, this guy was free released um, uh, soon after this photo was taken, but this is a sturgeon, a group of fishes I've been studying since I was an undergraduate. But this is the first time I held one alive. And I was working with local fishers to better understand this, this species. And, and that's often what I do. So I get to travel quite a bit to work with locals to better understand what they understand and to incorporate that into our scientific knowledge and help um, them better understand sometimes their own environments. But they're often teaching me as much as I'm, I might be uh, teaching them. And so for another example, this is uh, my friend Shay in Tanzania. We're collecting in this mangrove habitat, which is his home. And um, he knows when the tide comes in and out. And he might not know the scientific names of some of these species, but he certainly knows um, uh, more about these species than I do. And I, I'm sort of trying to catch up um, our scientific understanding with what Shay knows from as being a local and putting that in a, a sort of global context. And what we're doing here is, is collecting these fishes. We're taking DNA samples so that we can better understand the tree of life. We're taking what are called vouchers. So these are what ends up in a jar. Uh, these specimens are permanently preserved. They're evidence of what exists and where. And they're data points about how much mercury is in the water. It could be about how old species get, how they change over time. And so that's the evidence that we need for this kind of research that we do. So I've been very lucky. I've gotten to travel quite a bit. In fact, I just got back from the Galapagos a week and a half ago. Um, it was a wonderful trip with students. Um, but a lot of my research is in the neotropics, in freshwaters and into West Pacific and in marine waters, but also in cave habitats. And what we get to do from that is sometimes we discover new species. And these are the 15 new species I've described for science. And oh my goodness, those yeah. are amazing looking fish. Aren't they cool? So there's uh, cave fishes from Mexico and Australia and Madagascar. There's deep sea things, but there's things from our backyard too. So like these, uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but in the middle there, there are bat fishes. And those were uh, found just on my first trip off to the Gulf of Mexico when I moved here from New York. And there are new species everywhere. Um, there are new species from Indiana. One of these cave fishes from Indiana. So um, it sometimes just takes someone to compare, you know, what's out there with what we know existing in museums. And that's called taxonomy. And that's part of the ichthyology that I do. We also rename parts of the tree of life. So we change tribes and families and genera. So these are higher levels than the species. So we don't just discover new species, but new parts of the tree of life are described. And that's not as easy to explain to people until COVID hit. So if you're paying attention to new COVID variants, people now know like what the Delta variant is from the kind of work that we do in evolutionary research. So we're looking at uh, who's related to whom, and that's what people have been doing with with SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. And we do that in terms of not days and months like they do with viruses, but in terms of millions of years. So this is a, a phylogeny, a tree of life of this group of fishes. And it includes fossils from uh, much older than what exists today, but helps us put dates, like how long ago these two branches diverged from each other and may tell us about uh, different parts of the evolution of the planet as well. And nice. so what my, what my lab does is we get to go around the world and, and collect these animals, um, either study their DNA or their bones and morphology and figure out who's related to whom and how they may have moved. So in black here is what's called Middle America or Central America and green is South America. And so we can look at how these fishes the different species may have moved um, across the world and how they may have invaded a new habitat uh, in different time periods. 
And so I'll just highlight some of the projects my students have been doing and uh, former students and, and postdocs. So this one's from Caleb McMahon and uh, former Honduran postdoc Wilfredo Matamoros. They were studying this fish called Chordoheros wesseli, which is only found in two river drainages in, in uh, the Atlantic coast of Honduras. And what they found is that this species, given climate change and rising sea levels, will probably go extinct um, if the current models of how sea level change will progress does so. And so this is only these species only found on the Atlantic coast and with sea level rise, their only known habitat will be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we study natural history and we're studying these organisms to better understand their environment and how that might change, not just in the past or how it has changed in the past, but how it may change in the future. And we try to get people to care about, you know, these species. And, and this is one of my, my favorites. Um, I have a student from Guatemala, Diego Ilias, who just uh, defended his PhD. And when I met him in, in Guatemala, you know, I realized he had this very good understanding of, you know, why species are found in one place or another. And when he started working in my lab, he looked at uh, these areas of endemism or areas where species of conservation concern may be found. And he found this new novel area that led to people thinking, oh, we need to conserve this particular area as well. And so working with people that have a good understanding of, of nature and their uh, local habitat and incorporating that into sort of the scientific literature is, is a large part of what we do in my lab. Um, my newest student, uh, Shayla Rodriguez Machado, is from Cuba. And when she joined my lab, she was like, I'd really want to find out what these small fish that people eat call in the, what's called a teti fishery. People have been eating these fishes for a long time, but no one knew what they were. And they're juveniles and, and they were hard to identify. So she used DNA analyses to identify the species so that we can better work to conserve these species. So it's one of those things where it's like, well, you know, you love animals. Why do you um, collect and preserve these things? Well, they help us identify um, uh, the species that they belong to, sometimes new species. Um, so we, go ahead. Oh, because you can't protect them or uh, if you don't understand them, right? You need to know right. more about them. Yeah. So we say we sacrifice the few to save the many. Right, so we need to have these in hand to study their bones and to study their DNA so that we can better protect them as a species. And uh, so I, I talked about- Karuma. Oh, sorry, Karuma would really like to know how, how you name the fish. When you discover a new species of fish, how do you, how do you name it? Who gets to name it? Um, the discoverer or the at least the people who are the scientific discoverer, the describers get to name it. And, um, Sometimes they're based on a characteristic of the species. Sometimes there's a story there. So we named uh, one new species Typhliotris morari bay, which means big sickness in Malagasy because it made us all very sick in the sinkhole that we collected. Uh, <laughs> named another one, the one from Indiana is, is Amblyopsis hoosieri, so named after the Indiana Hoosiers, even though I went to the University of Michigan. Um, you know, we wanted to to acknowledge that this cave that it's from is from near the University of Indiana. And so sometimes we, we um, you know, have fun with the names. Sometimes they're kind of boring. You know, they're just describing the, the Latin version of some characteristic about it, but we get to name them and that's kind of the fun part. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm just showing you here, uh, Central America. So I don't know how many of you have been in this beautiful little uh, connection between North and South America, but it hasn't always been there. And in fact, if you recognize Cuba and Puerto Rico and Jamaica and Hispaniola here, these islands actually formed not far from the Galapagos, well before there was a Galapagos in the Pacific and moved to the Atlantic when there was no North and South American connection, no Central America. And so by studying these fishes that live in these land masses, we can sort of connect the dots of this geological puzzle and say, when did these land masses separate by basing it on, you know, how different the DNA is um, from the species that live in different places. So that's a, a neat thing that you can do with living things is study the past. Um, but I do a lot of work in, in the oceans too. And, you know, this is a typical view of the planet, but we really do live in a big blue planet. There's lots of 
oceanic water, but not as much as people would think. So this is one of my favorite um, sort of uh, diagrams of this. This is from the US Geological Survey. All this water in this ball over the Midwest that barely covers the Midwest, it's an 860 mile diameter ball. That's all the world's water. That's oh, wow. if you drain all the water in the oceans, all the fresh water, if you take all the water out of you and your cactuses and your dog, it would fit in this ball. So that's not a lot of water. There are moons of Jupiter that have more water than Earth. Um, that's amazing. Yeah. So for me, it's like, oh, people think the oceans are endless. So like, there's not that much water. And this other ball is the fresh water, the, the one to the right. You can see my cursor there. Mm -hmm. um, so that is all the world's fresh water. Most of that is actually ice in Greenland and, and the Arctic and Antarctic. And then this tiny ball kind of close to Atlanta is all the streams and lakes and flowing fresh water. That's all our drinking water. That's all the habitat for freshwater fishes. Wow. And there's about 35,000 species of fishes total species. Half of them are found in, you know, the majority of what this big ball is, which is marine water. And the other half are found just in this tiny ball. And that's also all freshwater mollusks. And again, all of our drinking water, all the water from the Great Lakes. Fit that, that's a, that's amazing. It's amazing. I, I I have to tell you, the first time that I heard that about half of aquatic species lived in the ocean and half lived in freshwater, just in terms of diversity, my mind was blown. I couldn't believe that because the ocean is so much bigger than it's our so freshwater bigger. systems. And that's why I study evolution, right? So for evolution and species to form, you need um, isolation. And isolation can happen in lakes and rivers. You can imagine they're separated from other lakes and rivers but in the ocean there's really just one ocean and so mm -hmm. even among the you know half of fishes that are found in the marine realm a third of those are just found near coral reefs which is why we care so much about those habitats and, and that's a very small fraction of, of all the oceans so um that's why we protect the places that we protect and and try to um, conserve based on that um, in terms of fresh waters my favorite views of isolation are, are in these caves. So this is me crawling out of a cave in Australia. It was actually, I'm um, sped it up because it's like a 15 minute video because I got stuck. I had to turn around <laughs> twice. At least getting stuck on the outside is not as bad as getting stuck underneath, which happens to a lot <laughs> to people who do this kind of stuff too. But we did find that these. Really, <laughs> sorry, that's a really small opening for a cave. Yeah, I'm, I always wonder like, can I still fit in there? I think I can, but like, uh, yeah. <laughs> It's my goal to be able to keep fitting in that little little cave. But uh, remember looking at it, going in there? All right, we're going in there. Yeah, sure enough. You know, we didn't spend a lot of time in there because it's not that deep. Um, but it was kind of harrowing. I could talk for hours just about that one, one space. Oh, um, but some of these caves are much bigger. So we spent six hours in a cave in Thailand in 2019 after this species, Cryptotara. What's in purple here is... Um, a connection between their vertebral column and their pelvic girdle. And uh, in vertebrates, we call that a hip, right? And fish don't have hips. This fish has hips. Why does it have wow. hips? Uh, it has hips because it climbs underwater, under, uh, under subterranean waterfalls. <laughs> so uh, this is not as steep as they can go, but they, they move in this strange sort of uh, what's called a salamander gait. So like things that walk on land. And it can do that because it has this hip. And so you see it crawling here outside of the water. You can see uh, it even raises its head as if it has a neck. So this is really strange for a fish. And this is why we spent so much time in that cave. Um, the only species that, of fishes that had this sort of morphology um, since the dawn of fishes was really the first fishes that came onto land. And the first fishes to come onto land um, gave rise to all vertebrates on land. So the mammals, the birds, uh, other reptiles, and ultimately us. And so by studying this modern fish, which convergently, independently came up with this morphology that the early first fishes who come on the land had, can give us, give us some clues about, you know, how we get this sort of strange bipedal walking, you know, we're the only 
uh, plantigrade flat-footed uh, vertebrate walking on two legs, right? And how did we get there from essentially what is the fish's body? Yeah. Now fish are evolving, and so they have a much better skeleton for living in an aquatic habitat now than even they did with our common ancestor. But, uh, you know, we study fishes because they can tell us about where we came from, because we came from the oceans. We came from this fishy body plan. And that's what I love about fishes. They tell me about evolution and they tell me about earth history, like I talked about before. So uh, I know I want to leave a lot of time for questions. So I just wanted to end there. But, you know, being an ichthyologist is, for me, the best job I could possibly have. I get to travel a lot. I get to meet a lot of interesting people who are, you know, know this stuff inherently because this is where they get their food or where they live. And, um, yeah, that's I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what, what questions you guys all come up with. Let me stop sharing here. But yeah. hope that oh, thank you. And for fishes. So I, Isaiah would like to know, back to that amazing pink fish with hips, uh -huh. what does a fish in a cave eat? Is there food in a cave? They eat blind invertebrates. <laughs> so they're eating small invertebrates uh, that live in the same caves that have the wow. same restrictions. And so, yeah, that's what they're eating. And... Um, Avery wants to know, can you find a new fish species just from looking at the skeleton or you, do you have to find a whole population of fish for it to be a new species? We've described new species based on single specimens. Uh, just it's on not, finding one. Yeah, just because you know, if you can compare it with what else ex is known to exist and you know it's unique uh, based on its morphology, you can also use DNA, but you don't always have to. Um, we try to when we can, but uh, not everything is available for DNA analysis. Um, if you can show that it's distinct, um, you can describe it as a new species. And um, most of the time you do try to get a population, you know, uh, where you can say, okay, they exist out here. Here's, you know, a handful of, of examples that we can use to study them. You know, I've described species where the samples are from something that's already gone extinct. And so mm -hmm. the samples that we have are all we, that we know about the populations. So that's a great question. Very good question. And yeah, you, you want to study it as much as possible to, to let, you know, as much information become available, but sometimes that's very limited. Yeah. Then Viv Aziz watching from the Gambia says, do you get to travel to other parts of the world and study their waters like off the coast of Africa? And you said you just came from the Galapagos, right? So I think you do travel quite a bit. Yeah, um, I think the Galapagos was my 36th country, gone, most, most of them for research. I have been to Madagascar and Tanzania. I showed the video with Shay that was in Tanzania uh, in this mangrove habitat off of Zanzibar. Um, so yeah, I, I love that part. I haven't been to um, uh, Western Africa yet, but a large swaths of land that's in tropical regions I have been to, um, not enough. You know, I need to get back to Madagascar. I hope to go back there next year. You know, I don't go for, you know, months and months at a time. So um, what I'm trying to do is get a, a good understanding uh, of what's out there compared to what's in museum collections. So, yeah, but I, I do get to travel a lot. I'm, I'm very privileged uh, in, in what I do and that I get to do that. And Nancy has a great question. Why aren't there any more armored fish like Dunkleo? <laughs> Dunkleosteus. Yeah, Dunkleosteus. Thank you. Yeah, Dunkleosteus is interesting. You know, it was huge. You know, their heads were, you know, as big as uh, my my office almost, right? And why would they go extinct? Well, their their teeth weren't really teeth. Like they got worn down. And so they have these big fang teeth, but they're really just part of their skeleton. And so they'd get worn down. And once they were worn down, they'd just die because they couldn't eat what mm. they eat. So, you know, what replaced them are, are, are other jawed fishes with replacement teeth. And, you know, that's why we have replacement teeth because, uh, you know, we're competing with our ancestors. We're competing with Dunkleosteus. And, um, and if you look at a shark, their teeth fall out all the time, almost every time they take a bite. And so they have these rows and rows of replacement teeth. Um, and that's, you know, believe it or not, even better than 
those huge jaws of Dunkleosteus. So we don't have those big armored fish because they're big and bulky and slow. And fishes today are, are fast and swift and good at avoiding predators. Re replacement teeth are indeed a nice feature. <laughs> Kayan Khan wants to know, what did that little juvenile fish from Puerto Rico turn out to be? Was that a surprise when you figured out what it was? Yeah, it was a type of goby. Uh, gobies are a very common species around the world. And they, just, they sort of knew it was a goby, but not which one. And, and so uh, what Shayla learned from her work was, hey, this is a species that, you know, doesn't come here very often. It's, you know, the fishery that they're after. Um, you know, it could be something that's exploited too much. You know, if you know it's most of the things that they're catching belong to just one or two species. So it might be something just to be mindful for. It, it, it is something that might be sustainable too. And they're not saying to close the fishery. It's just like, hey, this is what the species is. So let's see where the adults go. And what what's the impact of, of this fishery? And now we can find out because we know what species it belongs to. Excellent. Um, got another good, good question, and that a couple people have asked: Are sharks fish? Sharks, sharks are counts? fishes, yeah. And and so I I throw a, a wide net to use a fisheries term the, about what a fish is. But fishes are are vertebrates. Um, you could stop there. You could just say all vertebrates are fishes uh, because we all vertebrates came from a fishy ancestor. But yeah, things with gills and uh, you know, fins are generally seen as fishes and, and sharks certainly have those. And they descended from the same group of ancestral fishes that we belong to, all vertebrates belong to. And all the fishy fish that you think of swimming around the lakes and rivers and oceans uh, are there too. The only difference is that uh, sharks and, and their relatives are cartilaginous and we're bony. And so we're in the bony fish group and they're in the cartilaginous fish group but we all share a common ancestor. The parameter family asks, since you study fish, do you eat them too? Do you also mm -hmm. eat fish? Yeah, I, I don't eat other animals generally, um, but I do uh, eat fish. Uh, as a, somebody who lives in Louisiana now, it's pretty hard to avoid eating fish. Uh, do you and, have a favorite uh, fish? A favorite fish to eat? Um, you know, in, in Guatemala, we ate um, what are called blancos, this uh, Petenia splendida. And just the way it was cooked, you know, they caught it like five minutes before. They cooked it whole. They stuffed its, uh, they took the guts out and then replaced it with like garlic and, and vegetables. And it was just so nice. And, and you could, you know, I remember eating it and in, in, in near Lake Peten and, and taking apart each bone and just talking with my lab about the different bones and body parts. And that, that was a, a wonderful experience, not just for how well it tasted, but um, yeah, it was, it was great. Um, but yeah, I, I generally don't like uh, eating my study animals, but I do out of curiosity now and then, and I do like the taste of fish, especially in, in Louisiana, which is well known for its seafood. And I, Isaiah would like to know that Thai fish that you found in a cave that had hips, is that the only fish with hips or, or have there been other examples too of fish that can walk? Like what about mud skippers? Do mud skippers have hips? They don't have hips. They can breathe out of the, you know, with mud skippers are interesting because they keep water in their gills and they close the gills, which allow them to, to breathe out of the water for longer. But they're just um, independently came to land uh, to do that, but they don't have hips. And, um, so they don't walk like Cryptotara. So uh, other close relatives of Cryptotara, which are called Balatorid loaches, um, are uh, do have uh, hips, but most of them not to the extreme that um, Cryptotara does. And so that that's one of the things we're studying is how in this family did uh, hips evolve and why. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting question. Yeah, there are other. Fishes that come onto land, but not quite to the extreme in terms of morphology as, as that fish. Um, two more questions before we wrap up. What is the most dangerous fish in your opinion? Are there any fish that are dangerous? Whether whether from like risk to humans or from maybe being invasive? I mean, dangerous, I guess people are afraid of things like sharks, you know, but they're, you know, 10 deaths a year, 
roughly related to sharks. While we encounter many more sharks, I swam with sharks two weeks ago, you know, and I had no fear at all um, because of how rarely that happens. So I didn't feel in danger at any point. And we kill so many more sharks. We kill, you know, almost 60 to 100 million sharks a year, which is a crazy number. Um, so I, I wish they ate more of us. No, I, I don't mean that. But like, uh, um, dangerous, I don't know. I mean, so right now I'm, I'm most worried about things like lionfish, which are an invasive fish from Southeast Asia that are, is now off the coast of Florida all the way up to Long Island and all the way down to Brazil. And they have oh. no natural predators here. I didn't and realize their reach extended that far. Uh, they were just from a, a release, an aquarium release or, or an accident near Florida. And they've expanded their range, not just that far north and south, but into the depths. You know, we were catching them at 400 meters. Whoa. So, you know, those things don't have predators and they are they can even enter fresh water. And so, I, you know, they have venomous spines. So I'd... Uh, don't want to encounter a, a lionfish, especially. What would you know, happen? What would happen if you accidentally stepped on a lionfish? Would that be bad? It would hurt a lot. Um, you wouldn't die unless you, and people do have heart attacks and stuff like that. But you know, I'm I'm more worried about them in terms of danger, in terms of other wildlife, more than mm -hmm. us. But yeah, they do roar, ruin snorkeling trips and they do ruin the environment. So I would say the most dangerous fish right now at least in our part of the world is the lionfishes that are invasive and a good follow-up to that palmetto gal wants to know what's the weirdest fish in your professional opinion what's this what's the weirdest fish um so hmm there are i'll give you i have to give you two so i love blobfishes if you've seen google blobfish and you'll see some of the silliest looking creatures to leave the water um, but underwater, they look better, but they look very squishy on uh, when they come out of the water or taken out of the water. And they grow very fast, so they hardly have any bones, which makes them so blobby. Um, so for me, they're, they're very strange. They just look like a floating head. They, their fins are tiny. And they look silly. Uh, and then oarfishes, which is the longest bony fish, uh, they can get to over 20 feet long. And their back ends randomly fall off, and they have this weird metamorphosis. And, they're very slim, so they're only like this wide, but they can be 20 feet long. And you wow. don't know them. Yeah, I mean, they're they're really fascinating and beautiful too. Silvery and, and reds and blues all along their bodies. So I'm enamored with them as well. And they were just weird. <laughs> the weird fishes are good. I mean, we're weird fish. <laughs> we, we are. And there are lots of, I mean, hagfish and lampreys, you know, the jawless fish are really different. And then like you pointed out earlier, we have sharks, you know, and rays that are, have skeletons of cartilage. And then when you get to the bony fishes, so much diversity. Yeah, it's endless, you know, compared to the other vertebrate groups, there's still lots of new species to describe. Um, and there's lots of unknowns and we need more ichthyologists. So I hope uh, some of the folks on this call will will want to study fishes in the future. What <laughs> advice would you give someone who is thinking, yes, this is my dream job. I love fish. I want to study them. I want to have the ability to travel around and do research. How could someone become an ichthyologist? Sure. So first I would say study. You know, you have to um, study fishes. And, and the more you know about them, the more you realize how little we know. And then find that little area of the research that maybe people don't know that much about. So for me, that was uh, studying their relationships, and studying things like cave fishes, and um, find people who do that. So there's a local museum near you. I guarantee you there's one. And there might be somebody studying fishes, or there might be a, a professor or, or a scientist at a local university who you could reach out to and read their papers and say, hey, I'd love to join your next collecting trip or uh, take your class, you know? And, and as you sort of mature and, and get to go to university or, you know, even in, in high school, you know, find the people that are studying fishes and sort of tag along. Besides, you know, ichthyologists like me, there's people studying fisheries, the kinds of fish that we eat. There are people studying the natural environment in lakes and rivers, and you might want to tag along with them. They're government uh, related folks like wildlife and fisheries. There's plenty of people studying these animals in different ways. And, 
you know, the best way to join them is to work with them. That's great. Thank you so much for joining us, Prasanta. I'm so glad that we had this chance to talk. We'll Thanks, end by saying goodbye to just a few people here. Thank you for joining us, Deb Olson, El Hasham. I see Yvonne watching in Italy. Thank you to the Aziz family watching from Gambia and many more. We're so glad you could join us. And if you're watching the replay, I would encourage you to tech, check out Dr. Chakrabarty's TED Talks. He has several short TED Talks that take you through more aspects of fish and evolution and how many cool things there are to learn from studying fish. Excellent. Work hard, grow smart, and we'll see you next time. Bye.